real problem with the rich young man. Actually, I have several problems with the rich young man. You know, he comes across as this really rich, entitled guy who is accustomed to getting whatever he wants, and he just asks, you know, how much is it going to cost? Because whatever it's going to cost, I can get, because I'm rich. But he thinks that he can do something to achieve his salvation, that he can buy it or work for it. And that's his question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Well, as anybody who has inherited anything knows, you don't inherit. You don't do something to inherit. It is a gift given to you, usually by a loving parent or grandparent. You don't earn it. You don't work for it. It just comes to you. So that's one of my problems. My other problem is that it smacks of spiritual perfectionism because Jesus says to him, well, you know the commandments, and then Jesus lists a few of them. And then the young man says, yes, I have done all of these since my youth. Now, I don't think he's showing off. I think he's really saying, I've really tried to be a good person my whole life, ever since I knew what the religious laws were, what the commandments were, I followed them. But once again, he's trying to figure out how can I be so good that I will get eternal life. And as we know from the repeated promise from Jesus, it's not the number of good things you do or how good you've been. It is your faith in Jesus as the revelation of God that gives you that entrance to eternal life. And then my other problem with Mr. Young Rich Man is that he's asking all about himself, what must I do for personal salvation? And he's not showing any concern for the people around him. He's not asking what must we do. So I'm very touched by Jesus' response because it says Jesus looked at him and loved him. That's the only gospel that talks about Jesus expressing, showing the emotion of love, even though Jesus was clearly very loving in all his actions and teachings. This Mark says it. He loved him. But he's looking into this one particular person, this young rich man, and says, for you, only one thing is lacking, Mr. Perfectionist, who has always done whatever he could to earn heaven. Sell all you have, give the money to the poor, and follow me. And that young rich man is shocked at what Jesus tells him. I need to tell you right now that we are not meant to take this literally. And I can tell you how I know that just from how cryptic Jesus gets at the end of the message. And whenever Jesus is cryptic and puzzling in what he says, you're not supposed to take it literally. Jesus looks at this particular person and says this, and then he goes on to tell the disciples several things. How difficult it is for the wealthy to enter the kingdom of heaven. And they're perplexed, and he says again, and he says something different. How difficult it is to enter the kingdom of heaven. Now it's difficult for everybody. Oh, good. And then people say, well, then how can that be possible? And he says, well, for mortals, it is impossible, but nothing's impossible for God because Jesus is hinting once again, it has nothing to do with you. Entering heaven has everything to do with God. And yet there is some balance between how we respond to God's call to us and God's power to save us no matter what. And for much of the world, it has to do with money. In other Gospels, Jesus says you cannot serve God and wealth. So I define wealth as having shelter, having food, having medical care when you are sick or in pain. That's how I define wealth. Not having so much more, you know, scads of money that you don't know what to do with it. So according to that definition, almost everybody is wealthy in the United States compared to the rest of the world. So that's my definition of wealth. You're warm, you have a place to sleep, you have food, you have care when you're hurting or are sick. And Jesus says that it is money, money that separates us from the kingdom of heaven and separates us from following God. It's very trying. But my real problem with the rich young man, my real problem 
is that he reminds me of me. I tried very hard not to preach about this gospel. I tried to preach about Amos. I tried to preach about the psalm, any sentence in the psalm. I tried to preach about Hebrews. Great reading. And what does Hebrews say? It says the word of God is like a sword that just cuts through you. And every time I tried to preach about something else, God said, no, you're preaching about the rich young man. It reminds me of me. And if I'm be honest, most, a lot of people in, in, uh, in um, our neighborhood, San Diego, because... No matter what we do, no matter how hard we try to be generous and so on, in general, money is a major concern. It is what people talk about. I'm uh, 59 years old, in case you're wondering, so um, none of my working friends are retired yet, but I have older siblings and their friends, and they are retired or talking about it. And everybody's talking about acquiring and selling properties. Everybody is talking about the retirement plans. Everybody is talking about whether this job or that job has medical benefits. Everybody is talking about Medicare and what will happen, saving for sabbatical, going on vacation, what age you can retire. Everybody is thinking about the pile of money. Everybody. And if you're in a different age, everybody is thinking about should I put my kids in a private school or how will I have enough money for college savings? Will I have enough to buy a home? <laughs> Everybody gets tensed up about money. And so Jesus says multiple times, I hate to tell you, it's all over the Gospels. The thing that's keeping you from peace, kingdom of heaven, is money. Money. Worrying about money. Not money itself, but worrying about money. And this is not due to a moral failing on our part. We live in a system, we live in a country, in a world, but also a country that is very concerned about grabbing and holding on to property, grabbing and holding on to property that belong to indigenous people, uh, getting the free labor of African Americans who were enslaved and brought here, and then holding on to wealth. So it's part of our nation's history, including a nation that is has been deeply Christian in its roots. So, no surprise that our Gospels and, and our God keep telling us you have to get rid of that fear that you're not going to have enough and let go of it. Stop worrying about it. Stop worrying that no one will care for you when you're old. Somebody will be there. Just follow me. Now, I tell you not to take this literally. Jesus is gospel because he says to Peter when Peter says look we've given up everything our houses our wives our fishing business and then Jesus says whatever you've given up you're going to get back a hundredfold in this life and in eternal life I don't know anybody who's gone poor for Jesus got it all back a hundredfold it's also clear if you read the entire Bible that there are plenty of rich people in the Bible who are beloved by God, by Jesus, and by the disciples who followed him. There was no mandate for everybody to give up everything they have. There was a mandate, however, to let have money have less of a clutch on our gut and on our souls. So what could he possibly mean? I think he means that this obsession, this societal obsession that we have and the personal obsession that we have with both physical wealth, you know, money kind of wealth, as well as our own personal salvation needs to go away. If we get rid of our fear about our own personal salvation, we will recognize that we are rich already. We are rich in having a spiritual community to attend, that, and that attends to us and that cares for us. We are rich in the community that Jesus gives us and that the salvation he has already promised us. And we are rich in that if we really pay attention to what Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is already within us. We just can't find it because we're so tightened up about money. Interesting, isn't it? During COVID, when we were all uh, in kind of locked up at home, and we were all going a little bit crazy with being locked up at home, one of the things we found out was all this surplus income that people had it was widely reward, reported in the news, not just in the United States, but all around the world, that people could not uh, spend money on public transportation, they could not spend money on going out to restaurants or shows or things. They couldn't go travel and visit their relatives or go on fancy vacations. And so there was this abundance of wealth 
people were saving. Great Britain was shocked at the amount of money being stored in banks. But at the same time, churches were closing down across the United States. And I thought, how interesting that for all those people who had an abundance of money because they weren't going out and doing all those things, it wasn't showing up in the church's coffers. People were not thinking of giving the surplus to their church when in actuality that is something that the church asks of us. I am reminded of that because we're about to launch our pledge drive, our giving drive for coming year, and you're going to be asked to think about making a gift to the church. And what we're going to ask you to think about is sacrificial giving, not symbolic giving, not a little bit of giving, but sacrificial giving to perpetuate the life of this church, to allow this church to live beyond the next 10 years, to allow this church to live beyond a little bit of abundance given to us by somebody's estate plan a while back, to let future generations of children hear the same liberating news that some of you started hearing here 50 years ago. There will have to be a balancing of giving. We're going to have to learn that as the founding members of this church move away or pass away, that people who have been here five years, six years, will now have to step into that role of sacrificial giving. I was reminded of this at the Tai Chi class yesterday, I've got to get rid of my notes so I can demonstrate this to you, uh, about 12, 10 of us or 12 of us were at the Tai Chi class yesterday, and he's starting to teach us not just the movements, you know, not just the, you know, but also the energy work that is expected to happen during these movements. And he teaches us to tense and release, so do this and then, you know, completely relax. Yesterday, he taught us about tight-fistedness and I thought, well, this is interesting because I've been telling God I don't want to talk about this. And here's Mr. Tai Chi telling us. So I'm laughing and looking at our, our, uh, our junior warden because I went, I, I knew it. God wants this sermon. Tight-fistedness. He says, if you are tense, the energy cannot flow outward from you to others. It cannot flow within you. You must let it go and let it go. And again, we're going to tense up. And then we're going to let it go. And then I realized why we don't know what Jesus is saying at the end. You're going to have a hundredfold, and the first will be last, and the last will shall be first. The reason that we don't know is that we're not doing what he said. Give up. Give up your fear that you're not going to have enough. Let go of some of that money and see what happens when you do. See what heaven comes flowing into you and through you and out to the community when you let go of the worry. Let go.